Okay, guys, we had a little problem with the song here, so I'm trying to re-record. This is our PowerPoint on the judicial branch, and we're going to try to move on from here. So, enjoy. All right, students, welcome. We're going to be looking here at the judiciary branch, um, judicial branch, if you will, the judiciary. Um, and we're going to start off with the origins of the judiciary system. Um, we, of course, borrowed much of our um, co uh, sorry approach to the legal system from um, the British. Uh, we're going to see here that there's going to be uh, commonality, if you will, between both the United States and the UK, and that is in, uh, we are one of the few countries that sort of practices what's called common law, um, indeed, uh, what that means is that judge, it's basically judge-made law, which looks at prior decisions and customs when making rulings. And how is this different, say, from other places? Well, there's civil code or civil law, if you will. Um, and basically what happens in those places is that they enumerate um, ad nauseum all the various laws and rules um, possible <coughs> trying to account for every contingency in, in our case, instead, we have judges look at prior decisions that are similar to the ones that are before them when helping guide them as to how they should make a ruling in the case before them. So they will oftentimes look at prior rulings, how judges thought through or the kind of conclusions they made in prior decisions when trying to arrive at the proper conclusion um, when deciding the, the, the case before them. Um, that brings, then, our attention here to stare decisis, um, which is a term that means to stand by decided matters, that essentially judges will look to prior rulings as guidance, and they should follow decisions by courts of higher authority. I think it's worth talking about why this was um, considered a virtuous approach. If you could imagine that, you know, one of the um, reasons for this is because you'll find out if, when you look into the history of the United Kingdom, or more precisely England, that they never really had an official written constitution. They just don't. And so how then were they going to decide when persons ran afoul of the law? Well, they relied heavily on these uh, jurists, these judges, and so it comes from that kind of tradition and we continue that tradition, um, even though we do have a constitution, um, there was value to sort of making sure that judges, um, if you will, there was some continuity and some um, consistency to the way in which they were making rulings. And if you can imagine, this really is important because if you had inconsistency um, or lack of continuity when applying the law, that really undermines the legitimacy of the law. The law won't be as legitimate if it's being applied in different ways and in inconsistent ways, um, then it really sort of begs the question whether or not the law is indeed clear or is worth following at all. So, as I mentioned before, uh, unlike England, judges in the U.S. are first and foremost bound by the U.S. Constitution. Um, so the U.K. has recently <coughs> developed one, but they haven't had one um, for a long time. They haven't. They don't really have a formal written constitution. I shouldn't say that, but they have um, recently sort of developed a an official um, legal system with the sort of a Supreme Court of sorts, where they they were lacking that beforehand. There was this. The House of Lords. I'm not going to get into all of that, but the point of the matter being is that um, the judges in the United States are bound by the U.S. Constitution. If you remember, Article 6 makes clear that the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land and indeed would prevail or supersede any other law in the, the country. Uh, so keep that in mind. Also, American law includes federal and state constitutions, right? So we understand the federal. Obviously, we just discussed that one, the U.S. Constitution. But state constitutions will govern as well, specifically when we're talking about cases dealing with violations of state law. We'll talk a little bit 
hear about the fact that there is a dual system of courts. In other words, there are federal courts, and we'll talk about what federal courts deal with, and there are also state courts, and so they deal with state matters. So that's why we talk about state constitutions here as well, because clearly state constitutions are going to govern the way in which state courts act and make decisions. Now, statutes are just another way of reference, referring to laws. Um, so these are passed by legislatures. Um, the administrative law and case law as well. Um, the administrative law speaks um, specifically to um, like bureaucracy, things like that. And um, case law that's established through court decisions, that's the, another way of talking about common law. Remember, judge-made law, looking at prior decisions. And, okay. So every court has a certain jurisdiction, which refers to a court's authority. In other words, what cases they have the authority to decide, the scope of their authority. <coughs> And this is really important for students to know, right? Um, I need you to understand that um, you can't just bring your case to any court. Um, so, and that's partly why lawyers get paid, is that they know all these rules about which courts can hear what kind of cases um, and how they're going to be filed and what kind of claims you need to make. So there are entire you know, uh, courses in law school about civil procedure and criminal procedure. In other words, specific procedures you have to file, follow rather in order to file your case in one or another court. And in particular, I mean, jurisdiction is just talking about the court's authority to be able to hear a case. And thus, in essence, um, you know, certain courts will have something called original jurisdiction, meaning that they are the ones who can hear the cases for the first time. Okay. Um, other courts will have something called appellate jurisdiction, meaning they're hearing cases that have been appealed. And that one's pretty obvious if you think of the root word in appellate, it's appeal. Now, some students say, well, how are we going to remember original jurisdiction? Well, the way you'll remember original jurisdiction is that the uh, root word, if you will, in original is origin, right? And origin means where things start or begin. So if a court is hearing something based on original jurisdiction, that's because that's where it is properly originating. That's where it should properly start. So this is an important term, jurisdiction. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but I just wanted to clarify why it matters because courts can't just hear any case. You have to bring a case that the court is allowed to hear, and that will be dependent on jurisdiction. Also, to bring a case to court, in a civil case, a person or group has to have something called standing. And so in addition to making sure that you bring a case to the right court, you also have to make certain that you, as the litigant or you know, person bringing the case, have something called standing. You have to show that you have sufficient stake in the matter to bring suit, such as harm suffered. For example, you can't just say, hey, I don't really like the law in Tennessee. I think, you know, the laws in Tennessee are rather dumb. Um, I'm going to sue Tennessee. Well, for a variety of reasons, being a citizen of Georgia, you wouldn't be able to do that anyway. But we'll talk about that a little more later. The point of the matter, however, in this case is the fact that you couldn't prove that you are being directly affected by that law in Tennessee. And if you want to just bring it to the local level, right, Assuming that you wanted to bring a case about, I don't know, the, the side effects of, um, you know, uh, what could we put, you know, any, any sort of, uh, we talked about smoking, for example. If, for example, yeah, we'll talk about that in a moment. But it, imagine that there is something that you say you just don't yes, like, yes, but doesn't really affect you. So for, um, we'll talk about that in the next slide. But just understand standing. You have to prove that you've suffered some tangible harm and that there's some remedy for you. Because if you're just suing and there's no real recourse, there's no real route for the court to go, 
they also aren't going to then hear your case if there's nothing they are allowed to do about it. Okay. So, jump in here. <laughs> Get my first crack at it. Had to elbow Mr. Dobble out of the way. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so this is just a little di or a couple guys I found on online. Don't know who they are, but I, one guy is smoking. Other guys eating a salad. So, assuming you know, we kind of figure this one guy smokes a lot. This guy, other guy doesn't. So, who would have standing to sue a tobacco company if they developed cancer and they felt like they hadn't been properly warned, which you know happened years ago? But now, with all the cigarette companies have to have warning labels and all that stuff. But, but anyway, so who would have standing in court? Let's say we'll talk later about class action suits. Right. Who would be able to join in on a lawsuit? against the tobacco company. So obviously the person who actually has been affected by smoking, as opposed to say a person who's never smoked. Okay, so we're gonna go through different aspects of Article Three. Um, so we talked about Article One, sets up the legislative branch and has lots of detail. Article Two is also fairly long, which sets up the executive branch. And Article Three, sets up, <coughs> excuse me, the judicial branch. Not as um, long. It's much shorter. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we, I don't know if we, I guess we, I don't know if we shared the little mnemonic device with you, the large elephants jump slowly and sleep regularly, regularly. But that, just think about, you know, large elephants jump, legislative, executive, judicial. So we decided to kind of just put Article 3 into this, PowerPoint because, you know, it's so short, we figure let's look at it, let's go over it a little bit. So you see that it starts out with the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So in other words, they, they kind of, I think at the Constitutional Convention, they, they were kind of, it was, it was dragging on, it was a long convention. When they got to Article 3, they're kind of like, you know what, let's just, let's just do this quickly. Let's knock it out. You know, we spent so much time debating the other two branches. Let's just get it done and, and let's leave a lot of it up to Congress to figure out later. And plus, remember, they kind of thought of the judicial branch, as we'll talk about later, as the least important branch, the least powerful branch. And so I think they didn't consider this as critical in terms of defining the exact parameters of their power as much as the other two branches. So you notice they only create the Supreme Court in the Constitution. So every other federal court that we talk about in this PowerPoint was created by laws of Congress over time. And then you also notice that judges serve during good behavior, which is another way of saying basically a lifetime appointment. As long as they don't, you know, mess up and break the law and get impeached and removed, you know, they can serve for life. Now, they don't have to literally serve for life. They can retire. They can decide, hey, I don't like this job. They could, you know, move on to something else, but that's their choice. But they can, there's no end point to their term, unlike the president and members of Congress. And also, you see that their, their, their salaries cannot be diminished while in office. That's to protect them from punishment, say, from Congress, who might reduce their salaries, for, for example, if they didn't like some decisions they were making and say, hey, if you guys don't change that decision, we're going to change your salary to like $1 for next year. So as, we, as I just mentioned, Congress has the power in Article 1, Section 8, one of their powers is to create tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. In other words, all other courts that are below the Supreme Court which is all federal courts that we see today have been created by a law. And I think this got you guys on the test earlier this year, which always gets students, which is which of these is a power shared by the House and the Senate. Mm -hmm. And that is to create courts, to create a new court. So that would be just passed as, as, as a law would be passed, so, you know, created by the, or passed by the House, passed by the Senate and signed by the president. So in section two, you'll notice that it talks about the kind of cases that the federal courts are going to hear, the sort of cases that they're likely to 
um, decide. And you can see that, I mean, one obvious set of cases that federal courts are going to hear are any court, um, cases that have to deal with the Constitution or some right or power that's um, enumerated or disputed about being in the Constitution. So anything dealing or rising under the Constitution will be the domain for federal courts. In addition, um, federal anything dealing with federal laws will clearly be heard by federal courts uh, and or treaties. Um, and then there are some other kinds of uh, cases you'll um, see arise in federal courts wherever you have a dispute between citizens of different states um, where the amount is $75,000 or more. Those two are those, in fact, are the most common types of cases that the federal court's going to hear. But this gives you an overview of the kind of cases, as you can see, whenever, um, or rather, that arise under federal courts. Um, you'll see, in addition to that, controversies between two or more states. Let me add one thing there. When, uh, there are very rare cases where the Supreme Court will have something called original jurisdiction, okay? And again, that means that the case would go directly to the Supreme Court. Usually, cases that are get to the Supreme Court come to it by way of appellate jurisdiction. In other words, it first had to start at a district court, then get appealed to a circuit court, at which point that decision was then finally appealed to the Supreme Court. So that's most often how cases get to the Supreme Court. But there are certain circumstances under which the Supreme Court will hear a case for the first time, and or rather for the first time it will be heard. And that is um, one of those situations is when a case involves a dispute between two or more states. As you can imagine, that makes a lot of sense, considering the fact that you know, any one of these states would would definitely want the case to be heard in their own federal district court because they would have home field advantage, right? So in order to remove that prejudice or bias or home field advantage, the Supreme Court steps in and is the ultimate arbiter between disputes um, uh, as, it, as it relates to two or more states. Also, if it involves um, a state and citizen, uh, sorry, um, if you will, a foreign entity, a uh, foreign nation or whatnot, those two will be heard by the uh, Supreme Court. So I just want you to be mindful that while uh, the Supreme Court has both types of jurisdiction, both original and appellate jurisdiction, but its original jurisdiction pertains only to very rare cases. Um, and we'll talk, I think, a little bit more right about that later on. I just wanted to point that out to you, though. So you can see here, again, all the cases that will fall under the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Um, so again, we'll elaborate on these further, but you can read them here um, uh, at this juncture. So in all cases affecting ambassadors or other public ministers and consuls, um, or in which the state shall be a party, those are the areas that the Supreme Court shall have what's called original jurisdiction. Also, don't forget that um, in this case, you'll notice down below that the trial of all crimes, except for when it comes to, an imp to impeachment, shall be by jury. In other words, you shall have the option of having a trial by jury <coughs> You can imagine why the founding fathers may have been so adamant about this, because if you you remember or if you um, look into history, you'll notice that the British were often going to hold trials over you know base, uh, colonists in a way that was definitely going to be biased, because it would be some governor or judge, frankly, who was obviously in cahoots with the governmental authorities. Um, and you definitely wouldn't get a fair, if you will, shake or, um, you know, trial, essentially. Um, and justice would be compromised as a result. So, essentially, they wanted to make sure to enshrine this right in the Constitution and ensure that everybody had the right to have a trial by jury if they chose. But not in the, cases, not in the case of impeachment. Why? Well, because it, the way in which impeachment 
takes place is already spelled out, right? We know that Congress, in Article One, it talks about how impeachment get, uh, is played out. Um, in, I think in Article One and, and Two, I think is it, but just Article One is primarily, and we know that in the House of Representatives will have the first phase of the trial in which they are going to determine if there are sufficient facts to even have a case in the first place. Remember, I talked to you about prima facie cases. Um, so is there enough evidence in the first place to even move forward with the trial? And so the House, if they determine that there is, they will then officially file articles of impeachment, at which point then that goes to the Senate where the official trial will be held and the Senate effectively will act as the jury. So that's why that's an exception there, because it's already been spelled out in another part of the Constitution and that process has, um, you know, follows that particular route we just discussed. All right, so what is the main purpose of the judicial branch? So we've talked about the legislative branch, they make the laws. The executive branch enforces and carries out the law or executes the laws. And so you think about the main job of the judicial branch is to interpret and apply the law, to essentially to, you know, to judge the law and determine what the law means. And so, you know, a lot of people mistakenly think of the judicial branch as enforcers of the law. And I think they think they think that because the judge, you know, they think judges, and they think about a judge handing down a sentence in a criminal trial, right? And so, but really, if you think about that, the judge is not the one trying to find someone guilty, right? They're they're in the courtroom to try to apply the law to that particular case and make sure that the lawyers are following proper procedures and that the jury understands what's being tried and you know what they're supposed to consider and so forth. So the judge is, you know, is like the, the umpire in a sense and trying to make sure that the trial is fair and the laws are applied correctly. Sometimes they have to also interpret the meaning of law. You know, remember, one of the main powers of the Supreme Court and other courts is the power of judicial review. So think about, they review, they can review a law that is challenged uh, as being unconstitutional. So if someone challenges a law or an action of the government and says it's unconstitutional, it's ultimately up to the judges to determine that. So they're interpreting the Constitution, interpreting its meaning, and deciding whether a law is in conflict with the Constitution. And so think of it that way. So yeah, judges aren't trying to convict people. In fact, who who in the courtroom is trying to prove the guilt in a criminal case? Who's trying to prove that you're guilty? That is a prosecutor who works for the executive branch. So in our federal system, that would be the an attorney who works for the Department of Justice. And then if you think about who, who decided in the first place that certain laws or statutes, cert, cert, that made the statutes or laws that punish certain crimes and determine the length of sentences for crimes, that's the legislative branch. So, so don't confuse those things. And so I, so that's what I just explained. So what, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay. And remember, we mentioned this already, but just to, re, to reassert the, or this point, um, reemphasize this is that we, the only court created in the constitution is the U S Supreme court. All other courts have been created by acts of Congress, which means they also could technically abolish or get rid of some of the courts that they've created. So as Mr. Phillips has mentioned, all other courts in the federal system have been created. If you take a look over here to the right at the diagram, you'll notice here there's a hierarchy to this process. And again, it's very important that you realize that you can't just bring your case anywhere. There are very specific routes a case must travel in order to be properly heard, or in, uh, if you will, for a court to have proper jurisdiction over uh, that particular case. So you'll notice over here that, generally speaking, most cases are going to start at the trial court level. Trial courts are going to have something called original jurisdiction. Again, remember back to my discussion about original jurisdiction, origin, right? Originating point. This is where things are supposed to start. Uh, you'll notice over here to the right that on the federal level, or rather on the federal side of the courts, 
you'll notice that the trial courts are referred to as U.S. district courts, or for short, district courts from here on out. When I say district courts, I'm referring to the trial court level courts on the, uh, in the federal uh, sort of legal system. So I want to mention another thing, aside from just original jurisdiction, because I want to explain to you what that means exactly. What is going to be taking place at the original jurisdiction level? It typically, on the original jurisdiction, or any court who has original jurisdiction, they're going to be deciding what are called, what's considered questions of fact. In other words, they're going to be actually the courts that hear the facts of the case. They're the ones who ultimately determine what facts are in fact applicable to the case and which ones are not. And so they're going to uh, in indeed hear evidence and um, hear from witnesses. And I want to stress that the appellate level courts are not doing this at all. That is not their domain at all. So the trial courts, that's why we have a jury. Um, they're going to be determining whether or not a particular um, you know, set of facts indeed it amounts to a guilty or um, acquittal, um, guilt or acquittal, if you will, and so on. But the appellate level courts they have that what's called appellate jurisdiction, meaning they're not deciding questions of fact. They're deciding something else. They're deciding questions of law. And what does that mean exactly? Well, what it means is that they're not looking at trying to establish more facts in the case. That's not their job. They're simply there to review, to review whether or not the rules and procedures and laws were properly applied and followed during the court proceedings on the trial court level. That's all. They are not there to relitigate the facts. That is not their job. Their job is simply to determine whether or not the uh, trial court judge, as well as the prosecutors and all the other proceedings that took place during that trial, were properly followed and carried out. That's all they're reviewing. Was the process and protocol followed properly? Now, of course, they can make determinations about process and protocol that can have really um, wide ramifications and implications. So it's not to say that their job is very boring. It can have huge consequences for sure. But uh, officially, they are only determining questions of law, not questions of fact. So I really want to stress that when we're talking about the difference between original and appellate jurisdiction um, and uh, with respect to the courts. Now, speaking of appellate courts, so if you don't like the outcome of your trial court, or what happened at trial rather, you can appeal your case. Now, when you do so, you are not guaranteed that that appeal will actually be accepted. What you are guaranteed is that they'll review, the appellate courts will review your appeal to determine whether or not there's anything to review or if it's worth reviewing. Uh, if it's very straightforward and it's clear cut, they're probably going to deny your appeal. Most appeals, overwhelmingly, most appeals are denied, okay? But assuming that they have accepted your appeal on the federal side, you're going to go up to what's called a Circuit Court of Appeals, or the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. There are in total 12 Circuit Courts of Appeals, and then you'll add one. I guess I should say, in total, there are 13, right? And, um, but nonetheless, I want to stress to you that they are only determining questions of law. But at this level, you are most likely going to encounter three judges. Three judges are going to hear your appeal, okay? Now, on the trial court level, you had a judge, one, and possibly a jury. It is possible that you could have a trial with just a judge. That is true. But it is indeed your right to have a trial by jury. So you definitely have the option. So we typically refer to trial courts as, you know, we have a judge there and we have a jury there. The appellate courts, however, only have three judges. That's it because they're only determining questions of law. Were the process, was the process and protocol followed correctly? Okay.
Now, if you ultimately don't like what those three appellate court judges said or determined, then you can make your final appeal to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's interesting because it has both original and appellate jurisdiction. We mentioned that before, but in this case, um, in the scenario I'm describing, it, this case is going to arrive to the Supreme Court on what's called appellate jurisdiction. And this is going to be the court of last resort. In other words, there is no other appeal option after you go to the Supreme Court. Now, the, again, just as the appellate courts reject most appeals, so does the Supreme, so too does the Supreme Court. They do not accept most of the appeals because they believe, perhaps rightfully so, that the lower courts have rightfully decided how the law should be applied there, and they don't really see a reason for them to step in. But for those few and rare cases that the Supreme Court does accept, then they will make an ultimate decision as to um, the outcome of that case. Okay, one other quick thing is, if you look at the, the three <coughs> sorry, top categories, that's, those are, those are considered the trial courts, appellate courts, Supreme Court, are considered what's called Article III courts. Now, I don't think this would come up on the test, but just in case, the Article III courts, uh, meaning that they exist under the Article III authority in the Constitution. In other words, they decide cases regarding the Constitution and federal law. The bottom category there that says outside the judicial branch, federal courts outside the judicial branch, those are what sometimes are called Article I courts or legislative courts. And if you notice, they deal with issues that uh, in, that relate specifically to Congress's powers under Article I. So, for example, one of Congress's powers is to make rules that govern the military. So they have sort of given that power to military courts. So instead of Congress sitting in judgment or making decisions, they're, they've created courts in order to enforce the military justice and rules that they've established. Likewise, the U.S. tax courts. Congress has the power to collect taxes. So any disputes that people have over taxes would be decided in U.S. tax court, and that would be an Article I court or legislative court. So we've talked about this before. Why do judges serve on good behavior? And we're going to look at this also when we look at Federalist 78. So why did they decide to give judges a lifetime appointment? And... You know, so that that is, you know, remember, well, we'll talk about when we talk about Federal 78. So the anti-Federalists, one of their big criticisms was they thought this was way too much power to give these judges who have the final say over the Constitution, and you're giving them a lifetime appointment with, with really very little chance to remove them other than through the impeachment process. Now, why did the supporters of this, why did the framers of the Constitution decide to do this? Well, they basically wanted them to be independent and shielded from some of the political pressures that the other branches face. So the president and Congress are supposed to be responsible to the people. They're supposed to answer to the people and be held accountable for their political decisions, whereas the court is supposed to be independent of those considerations. Now, let's not get you know, too naive here. The court is very political, and the, and the members of the court have strong ideological and political views, but at least we can feel like, to some degree, they're deciding cases based on what's constitutional or what the law says, not based on public opinion or, you know, what the other branches would want them to do. So it also shields them a little bit from encroachment by the other two branches. So it gives them a certain degree of independence to stand up to the other branches. For instance, we talked again about judicial review. They can strike, they've struck down some laws in the past that have been highly controversial. So some of the cases we'll look at, like prayer in school or school segregation, and some of the things, steps they've taken, abortion rights, have been highly controversial. Had, were they elected officials, they may have been hesitant to make those decisions. But you know, giving him a lifetime appointment allows them to be a little more independent and to have a little bit more power to stand up to the other branches. So every court, every Supreme Court is 
named after the chief justice who presides over that court. So as long as that chief justice serves, that they're known as, for instance, the Roberts Court, because John Roberts, you see, they're always in the Supreme Court pictures. He's seated there in the front and center. And then they sit by order of seniority on either side. So to his right, you see Anthony Kennedy, who recently retired. And so now Thomas, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas, who's to Robert's left, will now move to his right. And Gins uh, Ginsburg, the little old lady at the end, their RBG, the notorious RBG, she, she'll she move to where Thomas is and so forth. So so this, they, that's just how they do their post. But anyway, so you see the Roberts Court. We're going to talk about some of the other courts. But notice how Congress has the power to determine the size of the Supreme Court. Remember, we said Article 3 is not very specific. It does not have a lot of detail. And it says virtually nothing about the qualifications for the Supreme Court other than you have yeah. to be selected by the president and approved by the Senate, right? <laughs> so technically, you know, you guys could be appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't even say you have to be a human being, I guess. So you could have a dog <laughs> on the Supreme Court, according to the Constitution. So as long as the president appoints the person, you know, appoints, the, appoints someone in the uh, Senate approved. So um, anyway, so it's the Congress can not only, I mean, sorry, the court composition changes with retirements and so forth, but technically Congress can also determine the size of the Supreme Court, which is, which is not specified in the Constitution. So we have nine justices, and you can see here that we've had nine justices since 1869, so Congress has not adjusted the size since 1869, but it did fluctuate over our history, I believe, as at one point was as low as five, and maybe at its high point had, I believe, 10, maybe even 11. But right. so anyway, so it has fluctuated, but it's been nine for quite some time. So you have one chief justice, and then every other justice is considered an associate justice. Um, some people ask, like, how do you become chief justice? Well, basically, whenever a chief justice retires or resigns or oh. dies or gets impeached, whatever it is, you know, that hasn't happened yet, but as far as a chief justice. But um, anyway, so once they leave office, once they leave their position, basically whoever is the president at that time has two basic choices. They can pick an entirely new member to the court to be the chief justice, which is what happened with Roberts, or you can elevate a person who's on the court to be chief justice, which is what uh, the previous vacancy, when that occurred, uh, is what Ronald Reagan did. So he he elevated William Rehnquist to chief justice. He was an associate justice. And then he appointed Antonin Scalia to be the new associate justice to take that slot. So, But when, when Rehnquist retired, George Bush, George W. Bush was president, and he simply picked Roberts to be the new chief justice and the newest member of the court, which you know I think seems like it would be a little awkward because you come in as like sort of the boss, but you're also the rookie, like the new kid on the block. So... Anyway, I, I think that's kind of interesting. This is simply a diagram showing you once again the, uh, if you will, a close up of sort of how the federal, the United States court system looks like. Um, not much to you know comment in particular here because there are going to be other slides where we go into more detail. Um, so uh, one thing of note here is that. In total, I told you there are 13, right, circuit courts. Um, you may be saying, well, wait a minute, that slide only says 12. But if you look directly to your right, you'll see the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuits, okay? However, go back to the left here, where it says United States Courts of Appeals and then 12 circuits. And what's interesting is that if you're going to look at a map um, of all the circuit courts, you'll find that... Um, it's very clear to see uh, circuit courts 1 through 11, all right? Because 1 through 11 are spread out among the states. So every region is a circuit, and all the states belong to one of these 11 regions. Now, you may be asking, well, you said only 1 through 11. You, and it says right there, 12. Well, that extra one is for the District of Columbia, the federal district, right? So it's not a state, it's a federal district. And the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals is considered the second most powerful court in the country. Now, why? 
Well, you may say, well, because it's a federal district, but why should that matter? The real reason why it becomes the most powerful court in the country is because if there are any disputes about the bureaucracy in terms of how it implements or is carrying out the law or between Congress and the president, those disputes are appealed to or sent to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. So their decisions have national implications. That's why they're considered so consequential and therefore considered the second most powerful court in the country only after the United States Supreme Court. So this is uh, just the same thing, the blown up version of the diagram we already looked at. So uh, again, just, just to note that those bottom courts are a little bit different. The top three tiers are Article Three courts, the bottom Article One. So Mr. Dobble has already talked about these courts. The federal district courts are the at the ground level. Again, they have original jurisdiction. So they're the trial courts of the federal government. Uh, there's a 94 current currently across the country. Each state has at least one district court. And uh, so, I mean, some states have two or three. And so it just kind of depends on the size of the state in terms of population and how many cases they typically have to deal with. So again, remember, Congress creates this. They could add or, or, or delete courts as needed. Um, they deal with cases involving criminal and civil, uh, cases involving federal laws and statutes, the U.S. Constitution, and we mentioned civil cases between citizens from different states if the amount of money is, is more than 75000 So this changes, again, Congress can determine maybe at some point it'll be, you know, 100000 or something. So um, Mr. Dabla mentioned this is the most common type of case heard of civil cases uh, dealing with different disputes, probably between like corporations or wealthy individuals. And, um, and then if you appeal from the district court, we go to the next tier, which is the U.S. Circuit Court. Now, just really quickly, as far as circuit court, do you, want, do you have anything else to say here? Well, let me say this. So this is just to give you an example. In Georgia, we have three district courts, and you see the hub of these courts are located, though they may have like satellite locations. The hubs, the main court buildings are in Atlanta for the northern district of Georgia. The middle district of Georgia is located, headquartered in Macon, and the court for the southern district is in Savannah. So they would handle sim simply the, any federal cases that come up within their jurisdiction, right? Within their, in this case, we mean sort of a geographic jurisdiction. So if you had a federal case and it was in, you know, you see, if it was in Marietta, that would be handled in the Atlanta District Court. And so I'll let Mr. Davila say what he needs to say. But first, I just wanted to mention you know, where, so just quickly, is where does this term come from? Like, why do we say circuit courts? Because the official name of these courts is the U.S. Courts of Appeal. So, but we often say, like, the U.S. Court of Appeal for the 11th Circuit or 9th Circuit, or we just say the 9th Circuit Court or Circuit Court. But why Circuit Court? Well, uh, my understanding is that the, the origin of that has to do with the fact that originally Supreme Court justices, before there were circuit courts, they were each assigned different parts of the country to go and hear cases. And so it was called riding the circuit. So you would travel from, say, city to city, and, you know, you'd hear some cases, federal cases, then you'd move to the next city. And, you know, Supreme Court justices, I think, used to hate this. And plus, back then, the travel was re really difficult because you'd be going on, like, dirt roads and, you know, they get stuck in the mud and all that stuff. And these were old guys, remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty rough. And so they just called it riding the circuit, you know, hearing cases along a path, along like a circuit uh, across from city to city, and they divide up the country amongst themselves. So, and so that's where we get that term. So we have different circuits, different regions of the country where appeals are heard. And I, I think... Mr. Dabla's already covered this, this, the circuit courts and kind of what they do. So yes, they hear cases only on appeal. They would not have any original jurisdiction. I think we've pretty much covered this. Right. I mean, the only thing is, right, I mean, I told you that when you are bringing your case before the circuit courts, um, you are going to be before a three-judge panel, okay? 
Um, and again, they're only determining questions of law, right? They're not determining questions of fact. That's already been established by the, if you will, the um, courts of original jurisdiction, so the trial courts in, the, uh, in our scenario here. But just keep in mind, too, that, you know, uh, on, in certain extraordinary cases, um, the entire um, sort of uh, set of judges for a circuit could be asked to hear a case. It's called an en banc hearing. En banc, all the judges from that circuit will be hearing that particular case. And these are sort of like some of the more cons most consequential kinds of cases, sort of that have really, really big implications. But again, remember this level, we're sim they're simply determining, has the law been properly applied? Has the protocol and process been properly followed? That's really the, if you will, the thrust here of the, um, of, of the work that's done on the Court of Appeals level. So you can see here the geographic boundaries of the various district courts. It's also worth noting that all of these district courts, or sorry, I should say, pardon, circuit courts, um, all of these circuit courts, notice the circuit courts and district courts. So the district courts are indicated by, notice like with Georgia, it, there's three of them, northern, middle, and southern. So you can see how they're subdivided within the state. So you typically have, um, you know, uh, eastern, western, and so they're geographic zones um, in terms of the district courts. But if you'll notice, the numbers indicate the circuit courts, right? The circuits, the various states that are contained within a particular circuit. And all circuits have reputations. Some circuits are generally considered more liberal. Other circuits are considered more conservative. For example, the Ninth Circuit that includes California and a huge swath of the Western United States um, is considered one of the, if not the most liberal of the circuit courts. Whereas if you looked at, for example, the Eighth Circuit or the Fifth Circuit, those are considered some of the most conservative circuits um, in the land. So uh, it's interesting to note because you'll see sometimes that lawyers will purposefully avoid bringing up certain cases in certain circuits and bring them up in circuits they believe would be more agreeable or favorable um, to get a favorable decision. Um, and this, again, uh, can lead to a what's called a circuit split. So you can imagine, for example, on the issue of gay marriage, you'll notice, um, or if you recall, uh, if you don't, then you can look into it. But the um, interesting thing is that a majority of the circuit courts were ruling in favor of uh, you know, making sure that gay marriage was recognized and was legal. However, um, I believe it was the Fifth Circuit. I recall, I can't recall exactly, but I believe it was the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit, and I'm almost certain now, the Fifth Circuit um, actually came to a different conclusion and ruled in favor of the states that were denying gay marriage. Um, and so as a result, that would, um, rather, that resulted in what's called a circuit split. And whenever you have a conflict between one or more circuits, that is typically a situation where the Supreme Court may feel compelled to accept that appeal because they want to make certain that there's consistency in the application and interpretation of the law um, across the land. So circuit splits are typically ripe ground for um, Supreme Court acceptance of those appeals. In other words, when those appeals are made, those are oftentimes um, accepted by the Supreme Court. Just a couple notes that I, one thing we didn't mention that's probably not, you know, test question or anything like that, but just uh, for, uh, just f uh, for your information, um, a lot of the, you know, we mentioned how the D.C. Circuit is, is the second most powerful court. It's also not notable that several of our Supreme Court justices currently came from that court. So it's often seen as a good breeding ground or stepping stone for a, just, a judge who might end up on the Supreme Court someday. So like, for instance, Kavanaugh and I believe Gorsuch uh, and John, I believe, I don't know, John, John Roberts, I think, I, I believe, anyway, I, I, I know Gorsuch, I'm pretty positive Gorsuch and uh, yeah. Kavanaugh were both from the D.C. Circuit, and I think several others. 
that are currently on the court. Anyway, and then if you notice, so the 11th circuit, again, is you notice the color coding. So the 11th circuit would hear appeals from, you know, the district courts of Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, potentially. So the 11th circuit would only review cases from that region. So the route to the Supreme Court is going to be one of two, right? We already, I sort of mentioned this before. Either the case can arrive to the Supreme Court on the basis of original jurisdiction, meaning that it, it sorry, it shouldn't arrive. It started, I should say, um, because the court had original jurisdiction. So it is going to be determining uh, questions of fact and questions of law, or the more likely of the two, um, it has arrived to the court on the basis of appellate jurisdiction. It has been appealed all, all the way up to the Supreme Court. And when that is done, there's a very specific way to appeal your case to the Supreme Court, and that requires for you, that requires you to file what's called a writ of certiorari. And, or certiorari, I'm not going to, yeah, petition um, for, for writ, or for review, rather. Um, but nonetheless, the point of the matter is, is that there's a very formal process and procedure to follow when you want your case to be heard or when you're appealing it to the Supreme Court. Um, and so, nonetheless, um, there's another rule as well. Um, at least four justices must agree to hear a case in the Supreme Court in order for it to be heard. It's called the rule of four. So you have to at least convince four justices out of the nine that your case is worth hearing and that it should be determined by the Supreme Court ultimately. Now you'll notice how few cases the Supreme Court actually decides to accept. Less than 100 per year are accepted. And most overwhelmingly, many, most of them, if you will, are turned down indeed, right? Um, now, let me sort of explain why that may be the case, because it's important to understand why this is happening. It's not just because they can, um, but it's because that the cases that ultimately um, per, you know, reach the top, if you will, are usually the most difficult and most technical or the most vague and charged sort of issues that really require a lot of thought, a lot of contemplation, a lot of research. And so they are going to spend a lot of time on these few cases in order to, because their decision is so consequential. And at least that's the idea, right? So since they are going to be <clears throat> deciding the hardest cases, the most complex cases, they then don't accept as many. So did you want to add anything? Well, just remember, none of this stuff here is in the Constitution. This is established by mm -hmm. the Supreme Court themselves. So they have the choice on which cases to accept on appeal. The rule of four is just something they came up with. If they wanted it to be, they could call it the rule of three and make that the new rule. So this is kind of like when Congress makes rules for themselves. The court also can make these rules. And the Roberts Court has reduced the, the court's caseload. You would think it would be the opposite, right? You'd think the court would hear more cases than they did in the past. But he's, he's attempted to reduce their caseload. And so, you know, if we had made this PowerPoint you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, we would have talked about that the court hears over, you know, maybe closer to 150 cases in a year. And so it really has, now it's really, I think recent years, it's been like 85 cases. So if you think about that, it's really, really hard and really rare for your case to be reviewed by the Supreme Court. And then, you know, it's, it's also a lot of the cases they hear are you know, relatively insignificant from the perspective of most citizens in terms of dealing with technical matters or business matters, corporate matters, you know, state right, states, uh, you know, boundary issues, whatever it is, right? But so we hear about the big cases, you know, that deal with individual rights, but a lot of them are more technical um, and a lot of them involve the U.S. government as a party to the case. So, but anyway, so think about how hard, I, I used quickly the analogy of like, um, you know, think about how many, peewee football players go on to play, you know, high school. That's kind of like the, the bottom level of the court system. How many go on to start on their high school team? And then how many of those go on to play in, in a Division I major college football program? And then how many of those go on 
to play in the NFL? And then of all the players in the NFL, how many of those go on to be in the NFL Hall of Fame? If you go from like all the peewee football players, then you, you go back and how many peewee football players are going to end up in the NFL Hall of Fame? That's kind of like how many cases that are filed in the United States each year will end up at the Supreme Court. So, as we've mentioned already, the, a lot of how the Supreme Court conducts itself and the rules um, that govern the court are really ones that they made up. In fact, John Marshall, one of the other reasons why um, he's such a famous judge, aside from having decided Marbury versus Madison, was that he set in motion and sort of established the protocol for how to decide cases, that the court would issue at least for the majority, a single opinion, um, you know, for the majority and a single opinion for the dissenting, although there can be concurring opinions, and we'll talk about that um, here momentarily. But the point of the matter is, is that a lot of these um, uh, procedures or rules, as uh, Mr. Phillips already mentioned, are things that the Supreme Court itself decides will be the way um, things run, and they can and are subject to change. Um, so most Supreme Court cases, what do they deal with? Well, I mean, we sort of discussed this too already in that, you know, we're talking about significant federal or constitutional issues, right? Not just any federal or constitutional issues. Again, remember how hard it is for the Supreme Court to even consider your case. So it really will only be those issues that really demand a lot of attention or are considered um, having, you know, a lot of uh, ramifications um, however, they are ultimately decided. So those things that are most consequential. Conflicting decisions, remember by circuit courts, remember I talked to, to you about the circuit splits. So whenever the circuit courts are in disagreement, these are also the kind of cases that the Supreme Court is likely to weigh in on and to um, you know, uh, accept on appeal. And finally, controversial, right? Constitutional interpretation. Uh, by a circuit court about a state or local law. Again, for obvious reasons, notice the qualifiers. Those are important uh, to understand why these uh, make up the bulk of the kind of cases that the Supreme Court will hear. So one example I give is just think about like a regular death penalty case. If, if, a, if a federal, uh, if, if someone was in federal court for a criminal case, and it was a serious crime, like a terrorist attack or something, the Supreme Court would not be likely to review whether or not a certain person should get the death penalty. However, if you were challenging the constitutionality of the death penalty, that might be a different story. Or if the death penalty were being, if a state, say, were executing someone who committed a crime when they were 16, and, and their state law said that you could execute someone who was 16 when they committed the crime, that might be something the Supreme Court would review, is whether or not that is cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment to execute a minor. So, so they might deal with that issue, but they wouldn't deal with just a regular issue of whether a regular person should receive the death penalty. So you can see here that the court is obligated to hear certain rare mandatory appeals in cases within its what's called original jurisdiction. Remember, again, that means that the case is properly originating before this court. And it, that involves, of course, cases that um, in, you know, involve foreign countries um, or where there are two or more states um, who have a conflict. I think the foreign countries uh, cases is obvious that you don't want a particular region um, deciding how the country feels about a certain policy with or trade negotiation or corporation. In other words, you don't want like South Carolina's federal district courts determining how the rest of the country feels about like a Chinese corporation, right? We definitely want to have speak with one voice, um, a national voice in this case, the Supreme Court, um, when dealing with foreign countries and foreign legal or issues, um, legal issues that implicate or involve foreign countries. Um, the same, again, is true with two or more states. You don't want the states to uh, ultimately, um, or rather, hear the case uh, 
in one of the other states because, of course, there's home field advantage and bias and prejudice there. Um, so here's an example, Virginia versus Maryland. Um, you can see it was a Supreme Court decision over rights to the Potomac River. It is worth noting that a good many of these um, cases of late but, um, uh, that involve states have involved water. In fact, Georgia was implicated um, in a dispute with or involved in a dispute with Alabama and Florida over water usage of the Chattahoochee. Um, and oftentimes what the court will try to do, like in the case with Georgia, is they'll first send Georgia and Alabama and Florida to an arbiter, uh, some arbit ar ar someone who will arbitrate um, as between the parties as sort of a uh, way to perhaps, um, you know, uh, prevent having to go to court is, is this a sort of way to avoid going through the whole legal process to see if the parties can actually come to a mutual and amicable agreement. Um, and resolution. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in our case, um, that didn't happen exactly. So, um, you know, uh, if you obviously, if you can't reach a conclusion, um, then you will, of course, um, have your case heard by the Supreme Court. But it is noteworthy that um, a good many of these cases now um, between states involve water. Uh, and I think we can expect that probably here in the future. Yeah, some people are so whiny, like the people in Florida. <laughs> we need water. We need water. It's like toughen up. You can live without that. <laughs> you have water all around you. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> Such whiners. Okay, so our the probably the most important theme in this whole class is checks and balances, right? And so let's just quickly review some of the checks that we should be somewhat familiar with, but let's look at how they relate to judicial branch. And so <clears throat> the president's main check on the judicial branch comes at the initial process of appointment, right? So he gets to appoint justices to the Supreme Court and judges to other federal courts, right? So he gets to pick usually people who, you know, from his party and who agree with his ideology and so forth, right? So, so that gives him a pretty big power. And, of course, we put the highest stakes on those Supreme Court nominees. Um, the second one is not really uh, supposed to happen, but it has happened uh, and numerous times in the past, which is lack of enforcement or lackluster enforcement of judicial rulings. So the president may say, well, you know, I, I am not going to say I'm not going to enforce this, but, you know, sometimes they do, but pretty much they usually just say, well, I'm not going to really try real hard to enforce this ruling because I don't really agree with it. So he won't put the full backing of the federal government behind this. You know, there's the famous case with uh, Andrew Jackson and John Marshall in a dispute over Cherokee lands in Georgia and whether, you know, the Cherokee could be removed or had the rights to those lands. And Jackson didn't agree with the with Marshall's decision. Now, I guess there's disputes over whether he actually said this, but the supposed line was, you know, Mar John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it or something to that effect. Yeah. So, um, you know, and then we have, for instance, with Brown v. Board of Education, where apparently... Dwight Eisenhower, who was president at the time, felt like the court had overstepped its bounds and was causing unnecessary conflict. And so at least initially, he, he didn't do a whole lot to press the southern states to integrate, although his hand was sort of forced in that area a few years later in 1957 in the Little Rock. Uh, Standoff. Yeah, so the Little Rock Nine and all that you'll learn about in U.S. history. But And then Congress has some important checks. They also have a, a pro, you know power over who gets on the court through the confirmation process, which we just saw battle you know the big battle over Kavanaugh's appointment. All this you know I guess in a few years that won't make sense. But anyway, so <laughs> but the uh, confirmation. So the Senate only right the Senate only has power to confirm presidential appointees, including judges. Um, the impeachment process uh, so they can impeach slash remove. So again the House would bring impeachment charges and then, or impeach through, you know, charging of high crimes or misdemeanors, and the uh, Senate would decide if they're guilty. Only very few judges, I believe, is it only one, maybe, Supreme Court justice in history has been impeached and removed, I, I believe. believe. so, yeah. But um, so, some, some also lower court judges. Uh, they can create and abolish new, new, or create new courts or abolish existing courts, 
Um, again, they're not typically in the business of abolishing courts, but they often have created new courts. But that is something technically they could do if they felt a court was no longer necessary. And they can alter or change the size of the Supreme Court, which is another check that has not really been used. But, you know, who knows? So uh, we'll talk in a minute about how uh, Franklin Roosevelt did flirt with the idea of increasing the size of the Supreme Court so he could get some nominees who were more favorable to his way of thinking. So this is just another diagram of the checks and balances. I'm, Mr. Phillips already went over that. I don't think we need to um, harp on this anymore because you've seen this diagram now for the third time Committ plus. Committing this to memory, and if you have a photographic memory, taking a good snapshot of it right. will be very helpful. I'm not, not suggesting you should at all take a snapshot of this and try to use it on the test like <laughs> on your phone or something. But yeah, but committing this to memory would be very useful. Right. Okay, so we see here confirmation of federal judges. All federal judges have to be appointed or are appointed, rather, by the president and confirmed by the Senate, as we know from the Constitution. makes it quite clear. But we also know that there doesn't have to be just nine uh, Supreme Court justices. There can be more. Um, but the point of the matter is, is that there is a process here, and this process can be rather contentious. Um, the confirmation of federal judges um, across the board, of course, Supreme Court nominees can be very touchy and um, fiery because the, these individuals are going to be appointed for life. So the stakes are really high. And so people get very heated about who's up there and what they've done and what they've said and how they've decided prior rulings because these individuals can then shape policy in certain ways because of the way in which they interpret things for many, many years to come. So this is a really, really important, um, you know, facet of the process. Um, again, you know, the likelihood anyone gets removed is very, very low. So these people will be in place, these jurists will be in place for many, many years to come. Now, you should note here that when the president is making the decision as to who he wants to appoint or who she wants to appoint to the court, that they have various considerations um, to weigh. Um, sometimes they'll look to, um, you know, particular gender and their demographic makeup because they want to appeal or appease a certain group in society, for, perhaps or uh, like I said, gender or race, uh, ethnicity or religion. Um, all of these can be possible considerations when appointing um, a, or uh, yes, appointing a federal judge. Um, of course, the baseline being that they should be competent um, in terms of uh, being jurists. But again, as Mr. Phillips noted, there's really no criteria laid out by the Constitution. So anything that we do see as a trend is really due to tradition and custom than because there's any law or, you know, rule in place. There isn't. Um, however, it is also worth noting that in recent years, you'll see overwhelmingly the judges that make it to the Supreme Court have been prior federal judges. Look at that, right? So overwhelmingly, those judges that are on the Supreme Court have been prior federal judges. And as Mr. Phillips already noted, many of them have come, come from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, there is one uh, jurist, uh, one justice, I should say, that is an exception. I should mention now that judges on the Supreme Court are called justices. Um, and so just as a sort of, um, you know, something to note uh, and, and a, uh, you know, a matter of sort of just logging that in your mind. But I will note that you'll see where it says government lawyers. Um, we had to edit in on a prior slide a little dash mark, but we couldn't with with this uh, particular slide, so we apologize. But there is one justice, uh, Justice Elena Kagan. She um, was the uh, second 
justice appointed by Barack Obama to the Supreme Court, and she was the Solicitor General, um, being the, if you will, the, the main lawyer for the federal government under the Obama administration. Um, prior to that, she was the dean of Harvard Law School, um, so she, you know, really brilliant, very smart, but um, she had a little bit of a different background than um, her colleagues, all of which were former federal judges, and, and that is very noteworthy because there's been a lot of criticism about the background of members on the Supreme Court not being very diverse at all. Um, even if they may uh, have a little bit of racial diversity, um, that's been very recent, um, and it is certainly not still in line with proportion. Uh, certainly women are underrepresented on the Supreme Court, um, so, in many ways, there isn't the best kind of demographic representation on the Supreme Court, but there's also not a very wide variety of um, background in terms of professional experience. Almost all of them have been federal judges. You may think to yourself, oh, that's natural, but it isn't. If you can see, look historically, um, that judges came from various uh, sectors of society, and people make the argument that it's good to have some diversity of views or people with different backgrounds because you can get you can um, uh, fall into what is called groupthink or where you're just sort of in this echo chamber and you're you're all thinking the same way and it's hard for you to think outside the box of, you know outside of what your colleagues or your profession already thinks and tells you to think or says um, and so bringing a fresh pair of eyes or a different way to approach things uh, is welcome. I should add that the judicial pedigree or the uh, educational pedigree of many of these justices has also been criticized. Almost all, if not all, I should say, the justices, all of them, every single one of them, has either gone to Harvard or Yale Law School. Okay, And there's no stipulation in the Constitution that in order to become a Supreme Court justice, you need to either have gone to Yale or Harvard Law School. Um, and myself being a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School, I, I can't stress that enough, although there have been great jurists from Minnesota, um, one being a Chief Justice, uh, Berger, of course. But nonetheless, the point of the matter is, is that, um, you know, this is a... Uh, of course, the most a, famous justice of all time, John Marshall, went to William and Mary, but you know, uh, who's, who's counting? Mr. Phillips's ego was on the line. <laughs> so it's very, very fragile, so we have to make sure to pay attention to it. All right, nonetheless, the point of the matter is, is that, you know, there's been a lot of criticism about the kind of um, people we have on the Supreme Court, their temperaments, their backgrounds, and so on. And this will be, I'm sure, food, uh, sorry, um, fodder for any uh, future Supreme Court nominations. Wait, you mean old white guys can't represent all of America fairly? Shockingly. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so um, anyway, so let's move on. So this is just more for interest sake. But this is, uh, you can see in recent decades or going all the way back to, I guess, the 1930s, uh, this uh, a couple professors, or a couple, I'm guessing these are law school professors, and they were trying to put the justices on an ideological scale based on their rulings and opinions. Uh, an opinion, by the way, is a ruling of the Supreme Court or any court where they write out their ruling and explain themselves, explain their reasoning. But anyway, you can see of recent justices, it only goes, it doesn't include our two, or really Gorsuch, you see, is on there, but they really didn't know yet much about his ideology, although I can, we can safely say he's been definitely up there with the most conservative justices like Thomas. But you see Clarence Thomas, the ironic thing is, <clears throat> look at the most, one of the most liberal justices uh, in recent years was Thurgood Marshall, the, if you see in blue, so not to be confused with John Marshall, but Thurgood Marshall in that light blue line for in the 1970s, uh, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, um, you, if you see that, and then you see Thomas, which is also a, a what is that, like a sky blue or something line? <laughs> Aqua, I don't know. But yeah. anyway, so Clarence Thomas, the only two African Americans on the court in the history of the court. And you notice one of 
one of the two African Americans in the court was considered among the most conservative ever, and the other, uh, Thurgood Marshall, one of the most liberal ever. In fact, Thomas replaced Marshall on the court. Uh, so that's just an interesting comparison. But anyway, so you look at the current court, you see, you know, Bush appointee Samuel Alito and, you know, Clarence Thomas was a, the other George Bush appointed him. Are amongst the most conservatives are, are all the Republican nominees and the, mo the more liberal justices were appointed by Democratic presidents, which makes sense, although that hasn't always been the case through history. But anyways, this is kind of fun to look at or interesting to look at. One other trend you may notice is that it's an interesting trend indeed. I, I don't know if we'll find that to be the case here in the future because so much more attention has been paid to trying to put in place ideologues. That means people who are adamantly um, aligned with a certain ideology onto the court. So, But at least in the past, we've seen a lot of fluctuation but generally, the trend has been, and we, you know, I don't know why, but you'll notice that at the longer judges stay in in the office, generally speaking, they become more liberal, and that's, you know, who knows why exactly, but that has been a trend. Now, whether or not we continue to see that trend here in the future will remain to be seen, like I said, but nonetheless, it is something worth noting. So. Obviously, when we made this um, slide, we didn't have the most current appointee. It was in, it was in flux. But uh, you'll see Justice Anthony Kennedy will be replaced with Brett Kavanaugh. But aside from that, all the other justices are indeed those who are in, uh, on the Supreme Court currently. Um, so you should note that. Also, again, like we said, um, you know, beforehand, it's interesting, um, the uh, makeup of the court in terms of um, gender, also in terms of um, religion. Uh, interesting tidbit, when we've done this in the past, I, you know, we looked at this and all the women on the Supreme Court have been appointed by, um, at, at this point, uh, Democratic uh, presidents, um, also all the Jewish members on the Supreme Court. Um, are also appointed by Democratic members. Later on, when we get into ideology um, and we talk about the kind of people or groups that tend to vote for one party or another, this may come into um, you know better perspective. You may better understand why that would be the case. I don't know what Ruth Ginsburg is looking at. She's checking out something. <laughs> <laughs> It's so just, is Roberts. Yeah, somebody, uh, someone was doing something. All right. So um, this, we tried to find a more updated list of this. We could not. But um, as of 2002, so this is just, you know, for your information, nothing, you know, you have to memorize the numbers. But just to point out that it's not really that frequent that Congress, I mean, that the Supreme Court is striking down laws as unconstitutional. But it is, you know, it is enough that it's, it is a significant power that has been exercised. So you can see 158 congressional laws have been declared unconstitutional as of 2002. Um, state and municipal laws uh, or preempt, preempting law, meaning that where the federal government um, was, the law was uh, considered to be superior to a state law, for example. So 224 of those, so a total of 382 laws that have been overturned as of 2002. I want to I want to stress at this point too that we're going to see here. I think in the next slide, right, we're talking about um, stare decisis. Um, it, it, essentially, you have to understand the court, um, while it's not a political entity, in, in you know in uh, sorry. Um, you know, as it's spelled out in the Constitution or anything, it's supposed to be a nonpartisan, obviously, entity. Um, it is, it does react and respond to the political environment, right? And so one thing that became clear, like with Andrew Jackson, right, when he refused to um, carry out the order of the Supreme Court, or he basically didn't stop Georgia from ignoring, rather, the order of the court, um, was that, you know, the court risks um, its legitimacy and credibility when it steps outside of 
too far outside of where the public opinion is. Um, now, it's, you know, in this case, you can see that given this huge span of years, how few um, instances there are where the court has either over overturned an act of Congress um, or law here or statute um, and or state uh, uh, laws and statutes. And you could say, well, but that's because maybe the members of Congress in the various state houses, they aren't uh, dummies and they can make laws that are not going to run afoul of the Constitution. You may think that, but another reason is that the courts have been very, very what's called deferential when it comes to the laws made by the political branches, meaning the legislative and executive branch. So they are very reticent, they're very reluctant to overturn acts uh, or legislation passed by governments. Be because, again, they have to realize, right, I mean, that's the will of the people, right? So if nine justices in this case are, who are not elected, um, are overturning the will of the people with some regularity, there could be a huge problem, right? In other words, a disconnect between what the people want and what the government's doing, and they want to avoid that kind of um, appearance. So you'll see that they're very reluctant to really overturn um, acts of Congress or um, state, or, uh, state laws and ordinances. Uh, they generally are very deferential, meaning they give the benefit of the doubt. They give the benefit of the doubt to um, governments usually. Now, there are some rare cases, like when it comes to laws that deal with race or laws that deal with gender, then the, the burden is on the government to prove they've done something right. But generally speaking, they give the benefit of the doubt to the political branches when passing, uh, or rather when determining the constitutionality or legality of the law. Let's clarify one thing, and that is maybe, I don't know if you've mentioned this already, but we, that the court can only decide issues that are brought to it in terms of, you know, it's an adversarial system where someone has to challenge a law in court. So there's probably a, a lot of laws in our country that may be potentially unconstitutional, but they've never been actually challenged or they've never reached, you know, the higher courts. But but anyway, so remember, the court cannot just wave a magic wand and strike down a law. And, and there is no provision in the Constitution where a law that's passed by a state government or by the U.S. government has to then be reviewed by the courts. They only can be reviewed by the court if someone first challenges it in court. Someone has to bring it to court. And remember, they have to have standing, right? They have to have the right to bring that case, have to have been affected by that law. So, so you know, lots of unconstitutional things happen across the country on a daily basis. But if no one has ever challenged that, then it the court's not going to be able to strike it down. So this is an interesting slide on, you know, so what can the people do? What can the other branches do? What can the states do and so forth? If they don't like a federal court decision, especially a Supreme Court decision, what can be done? So can they just overturn it? Well, technically, no. Um, so if the Supreme Court makes a ruling that, say, in the case of Roe v. Wade, that abortion is con a constitutional right, a state cannot turn around, nor can Congress turn around, and simply pass a law that says, no, it's not. You know, so they can't just defy the court in that sense. But what can they do? So they could try to, here's some examples, change the number of judges on the court. So we'll talk about that with FDR. Some people think maybe you know, that's something we might need to do in the near future. Uh, so, our, so like to increase the size of the court so that you, know, you might try to pack the court with people who would change the rulings that you don't like. Uh, you could revise legislation, so Congress could try to fix the legislation. So if Congress, oh, sorry, if the Supreme Court, for instance, ruled that a law was unconstitutional for one specific provision that made it unconstitutional, Congress could try to repass that law and make the fixes or changes that they think the court was looking for. Now, the ultimate way to overturn the Supreme Court it would be to amend the Constitution. So if someone was just really strongly opposed, again, to, say, Roe v. Wade, and you want to change the laws on abortion, you could try to propose a constitutional amendment that says abortion is 
uncon or is illegal essentially, right? To say it, it's not a right protected in the Constitution. But we know that it's very hard to amend the Constitution, right? It takes two thirds vote, typically two thirds vote of the House, two thirds vote of the Senate, and three fourths of the states to approve it. So, so it's very hard to do that. And I can't think of a, a, an amendment that was specifically passed to overturn a Supreme Court ruling per se, but um, you could alter the jurisdiction of the court. So Congress could alter the ability of certain lower federal courts to hear cases. So they could try to change the law, you know, on what types of cases they can hear. Um, this also, I think, is fairly rare. And you also could restrict the remedies like we talked about where, in other words, this, the executive branch, since the Supreme Court relies or the courts rely on the executive branch to enforce their rulings, the president could simply, you know, refuse to enforce it, which, again, he's not supposed to do. He's not supposed to pick and choose which, which court rulings he's going to enforce. But we know the reality is that that sometimes has happened. So the judicial branch, of course, was designed to be, you know, above the fray and not involved in the uh, sort of in politics. Um, but the reality is quite different. As Mr. Phillips has mentioned, um, these are individuals. These individuals have been highly involved in government uh, for much of their life. And when you are someone who's been involved in government for any prolonged period of time, you're most likely going to be somebody who's developed opinions about government uh, and have uh, identified yourself with one or the other party because most jobs in Washington or around government are also associated with party, um, or many of them are, not all of them, I should say. But nonetheless, you can see here appointments, uh, rather the appointment process, is very political in many ways, especially nowadays. Uh, the executive branch in determining who they may nominate to the federal uh, court uh, is often um, swayed by and also heavily lobbied by various interest groups. Um, they are very influential. In fact, um, one example comes to mind, um, uh, uh, a, a particular nominee, George W. Bush, um, Harriet Meyer, I think was her name, um, she was going to be his um, nominee, uh, and some conservative interest groups um, actually uh, undermined her nomination, and in fact had him, or had her, withdraw her nomination, or rather asked to withdraw her nomination because of all the pressure and flack that George W. Bush was getting for nominating her, and they deemed her insufficiently conservative. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, that I think that was one of the more recent examples of that. But thereafter, presidents have been very attuned to interest groups and various demographic groups that vote for them in determining who they elevate to the Supreme Court. And that's a rather unfortunate thing. In other words, the veneer, the, the veil of, you know, uh, or appearance that this is a nonpartisan process, I think has really been, um, you know, uh, taken away and, and frankly uh, has revealed a process that is, uh, that takes um, partisanship and or ideology very much into account. Um, you'll notice that the confirmation hearings Mr. Phillips mentioned already and I did as well with respect to Brett Kavanaugh, the most recent one, and others before him, you know, um, that were very contentious and um, essentially uh, got mired into details that had much more uh, to do with scoring ideological points than really determining the fitness of the um, candidate before them, although uh, there have been instances where the Senate has really tried to get to the temperament and the character of the nominee before them and have raised legitimate concerns. Um, so it's very interesting to see these hearings unfold. Um, of course, the political beliefs of judges and justices themselves, right? I mean, all of these components uh, inject a level of politics and partisanship um, into this process. And so just keep in mind, right, that when we're talking about it, um, the Supreme Court um, is indeed a body that attempts to, of course, apply the law by looking at the Constitution and sort of looking at what the law dictates rather than 
you know, what they may believe is the right decision. However, the reality is, is that personal ideology is going to filter into this process um, to some degree, hopefully to a lesser degree. But uh, I think that what we've seen recently is increasingly a trend to, um, you know, uh, to see that judges have um, may, uh, in fact, um, you know, consider their their ideological leanings when rendering decisions. In other words, at least that's been the um, criticism thus far that we've seen some really uh, important cases um, arrive to the Supreme Court, and they have been decided, the, especially the most controversial ones, in ways that have consistently fallen, um, you know, conservative liberal. In other words, there has been a very clear, very clear delineation here how the liberals would vote and how the conservatives would vote. In other words, it's, er, it's erasing this idea uh, or this veneer that there is somehow this sort of um, dispassionate approach whereby they're just looking at the law and, and they're being neutral. But, you know, I, I guess... You know, if you wanted to push back against that idea a little bit, I would tell you that that is still a very, um, the prevailing, if you will, trend. Um, the court people, or sorry, the justices on the court would tell you, and the Supreme, the Chief Justice in particular, would note that the majority of the decisions the Supreme Court arrives at are nearly unanimous, okay? At least in the past they've been. Um, especially on like technical or uh, matters, very legalistic matters or legalese, um, they have reached more common consensus. But on the most, if you will, pressing or social matters or issues and um, those issues that sort of are the most controversial or what we call hot button issues, um, the court has been pretty consistently um, you know, divided along ideological lines in terms of how they decide those cases. So that has really begged the question, you know, how, uh, how can we expect, you know, um, this sort of impartiality then when we're coming before the court? You know, the idea is, is that justice should be blind. And so there's a real question about the integrity of this branch if, in fact, what we're seeing is more and more so these kind of trends. Now, some would argue, hey, that's perfectly fine. You know, what we should see is that, you know, judges are people too, and there is vagary, there are vagaries in the law, and so they're going to have to revert to their um, particular perspectives. But, you know, these are just things to keep in mind as we move along and, and consider the impact of the court and how it works. All right, so... We're going to hopefully do an activity on this in class to drive home these points a little bit more. But so when we talk about judicial philosophy, there's sort of two different sets of conflicts when we talk about how judges view the Constitution and the law. So one uh, one conflict is between those judges who believe in judicial activism or try to follow the principle of judicial activism and versus those who follow judicial restraint. And then there's another two camps where you look at so those judges who follow, who believe in a strict construction or strict interpretation of the Constitution, and although the, the other side doesn't have necessarily an official name, but we're going to use the terms like loose or broad construction. So let's delve into these a little bit. So the first one, um, judicial activism, refers to the, the idea that judges should play an active role in promoting justice as they see it try to shape the law in the way they think it should be so that the judge, how does a judge approach his or her job as a judge? And they're okay with uh, jumping into the political fray and, you know, even allowing their personal and political opinions to influence their judicial decisions. The term legislating from the bench so that, you know, you, you, you're okay with making laws or even overturning decisions by the political branches, the legislative and executive branch, overturning their their decisions when you think they're wrong. And so that that approach would be referred to as judicial activism. Judicial restraint, the opposite philosophy supposedly is where judges would refrain from making these political decisions that and whenever possible they would defer to the elected branches 
and, and let them decide unless what, they, unless what the elected branches have decided is clearly unconstitutional, and that judges should avoid allowing their personal and political opinions to get involved with their decisions, that they should just sort of be these neutral arbiters who call balls and strikes and you know, they don't let their opinions get into it, um, and that they should therefore interpret the law and not make the law. Now, we'll talk a little bit later about how this is, you know, sometimes people like to claim they're activists or that they believe in restraint, depending on the situation. So that's why I kind of said it in a mocking tone, because the idea that, you know, judges are these neutral sort of robotic type creatures who can just, you know, beep, 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 you know, look at the Constitution. OK, the Constitution says I should do this, so therefore I should do. I mean, that the idea that they could do that or that they try to even do that. Is, is, is somewhat, um, you know, uh, doubtful. So another, another conflict comes over how the Constitution should be interpreted. And a lot of times, you know, sort of broad, or sorry, loose or broad construction goes often is associated with judicial activism, and a more constrict construction of the Constitution is, is associated with judicial restraint, but we'll see also that that's not always the case. And so a broader interpretation would say that the Constitution should be read more broadly, you know, more loosely, that you should sort of read between the lines and try to look at the spirit of the law instead of the literal nature of the law, and that the Constitution has to be a living document that changes with the times. And so as someone who approaches the Constitution in this way is willing to sort of broaden the meaning of certain clauses in order to maybe achieve certain outcomes. Whereas a strict constructionist believes that in a narrow interpretation of the Constitution, that you should try your best just to look at what's literally written and not read into it. And so don't try to read between the lines, just look at it as it's written and interpret it as literally as possible. And so these judges often also look to what's called original intent so there are sometimes, you know, people who believe in original intent, meaning what was the intent of the founders or what was the intent of the framers who wrote this statute or who wrote this amendment or who wrote the Constitution. So they, they would reject the notion of a living Constitution and say, like, to the best of our ability, let's figure out what the writers of the Constitution meant when they wrote this. So as Mr. Phillips has mentioned, this notion here that the justices are going to perfectly divine and discern the intent of the framers in how the Constitution was created is unrealistic, right? And so you'll see that oftentimes both sides, both the liberals and conservatives on the court will claim, you know, that they are indeed following what the Constitution says, and this is consistent with the letter of the law, or at least what the Constitution intended, right, the original intent. Um, the reality is, is that it's almost impossible to know precisely what it is that the founding fathers wanted uh, for a couple reasons. One, they purposely left some parts of the Constitution open-ended and vague because they themselves um, were not very clear as to what they were ultimately going to agree on. And that brings me to my second point, is that, um, rather I should continue with my first point, sorry, it's getting a little later today. Um, but the idea was is that they purposely left things open-ended because they wanted to leave or build in flexibility um, for the Constitution to be able to adapt to changing circumstances, they knew they couldn't account for every possible contingency that would ever happen in the future. So, yes, of course, they had the amendment process in there, but they also left things open-ended and added clauses like make all laws not necessary and proper, right? So these sort of more open-ended aspects to the Constitution were purposeful. They were intentional so that they could adapt to the times. And so, um, to some extent... Uh, you know, be determined later. But you'll notice that um, the other big problem with persons who claim to be able to know exactly, uh, these are criticisms, of course, of this approach, would be that 
how could you possibly claim to know what the founding fathers wanted if they didn't agree amongst themselves? I mean, the founding fathers had people who were, of course, uh, adamantly opposed to each other. I mean, we had instances where you know people were um, disparaging each other on a regular basis, you know, so in, in very harsh terms and ways. So the idea that somehow, you know, a, a, a justice in the 21st century is one, able to discern exactly what the framers wanted or what they intended, and two, um, whether or not that was even possible in the first place because they didn't agree uh, as amongst themselves or, uh, you know, as between themselves. And, and then finally, you know, there's another criticism here, and that is, what is the value or is it really appropriate to put yourself in the shoes of all white male land-owning elite men during the 1700s to determine how the term equality, for example, should be interpreted, say, in the 20th or 21st century. So these are all like criticisms, really, of this approach. But I also just want to highlight the fact that it's really hard, you know. I mean, both sides are going to claim that they are the ones that are adhering mostly to the Constitution. And whenever one ideological side doesn't like the way a case comes out, they will almost always claim that it's the result of judicial activism on the court, that the court somehow is just making stuff up um, to favor their side. Um, and, and so you have to take these things with a grain of salt and arrive at your own conclusions, of course. But I think it is worth considering some of the challenges of claiming you know, to be able to divine or discern the Constitution perfectly. I mean, there's some really, really big challenges with that uh, approach, but there's a merit to it as well, right? I mean, constructionists would tell you, hey, you know, we don't want people just having nothing to anchor their decisions. I mean, at the very least, we can claim that we're trying to anchor our decisions in some sort of settled law, um, and that can be beneficial because then there can be some expectation and um, dependability in terms of what one can um, expect from the law and the application of the law. So it's good because, you know, to some extent we can say we all can draw from a similar document when we're trying to make conclusions as opposed to just being a free-for-all and, you know, there being no sort of guidance at all. Um, again, you know, weigh these things accordingly, um, but of course, uh, I you know, Mr. Phillips already mentioned it. It's the difference between maybe sometimes looking at the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. What was the ultimate, um, you know, uh, goal here um, versus what was actually said um, also can be uh, another way of looking at it. All right, so I might have to check out here soon. <laughs> Let Mr. Davila finish. And then I'm trying to get to a football game. Anyway, so... <laughs> Judicial activism, judicial restraint. So what's the difference? So judicial activism and restraint um, are more like how a judge approaches his or her job. It's the mindset of the judge. You know, what is my proper role? Am I here to sort of save the world or am I here just to, you know, again, call balls and strikes and, you know, only decide things that are clearly unconstitutional? Should I mainly defer and let the elected officials decide most of the controversial things, and I only step in when there's a dispute over the law or a dispute over what should be done. Uh, a strict versus loose construction has to do more with um, how the law itself and the Constitution itself should be interpreted. So this is more of an application of law um, or you know reading the Constitution itself. And so it's not really, it is sort of also an approach, but but like, you know, it's actually one is sort of how you should behave as a judge and how active you should be in, in solving problems. And the other is how should we actually read the Constitution? So there is a difference. There is it is dis, there's a distinguishing you know, factor here between the two. But it's it's it, they it, there is also some overlap. So so a strict constructionist, again, tries to often say, what did the framers intend you know, when they wrote this, whether it's the framers of the original Constitution or, for instance, the framers of the 14th Amendment or the framers of a particular statute. And so, you know, I think both both sides have some good points, but um, but to claim that, you know, you're consistent and you always follow the same philosophy, you know, we, we often, I could, I would, you know, Mr. Alvin and I would both say that's kind of 
as we might say, poppycock. Yes. <laughs> you guys know that word, right? Or balderdash. <laughs> Those words that I'm sure you use. Indeed. So it's another word for words that are acceptable, but we could use other words. Right. You know, you probably know what they are. So, uh, so here we just have a list of all the chief justices. Notice how few there have been since they are lifetime appointments. Now, there were some quick turnarounds at the beginning. You can see a lot of chief justices came and went, but John Marshall really, you know, stood, he stood as still as the longest serving chief justice. And, you know, he really had a huge impact, which we'll talk about in a second. But we're going to focus on three in particular, the ones that are highlighted here. Um, you see John Marshall and Earl Warren and then William Rehnquist. So the initial phase of the Supreme Court, remember originally the court really didn't have a lot of specific powers granted to them in the Constitution. They weren't really sure what they were supposed to do. Um, the, the framers thought that this would be the least dangerous branch, as it says here with Alexander Hamilton, as we'll look at in Federal 78. Um, you know, they did anticipate judicial review would be would be a power that they would have, but they did not see they did not think the court would be so involved in the major you know political and social disputes of our of our of our times like they are now. And so, um, anyway, so you see the original at, at first the court didn't have much clarity as to what they were supposed to do. In fact, the original Supreme Court didn't even have like they didn't even think of giving them a real place to meet. They didn't have their own yeah. courtroom. They had to meet in the basement of the <laughs> Senate building. And so, and I, I've heard a story also that one of the justices showed up on the on day one and he had like a wig on, you know, like the British judges wear wigs. And so, and everybody else kind of looked at him funny, like, what the heck are you doing, man? You know, so they weren't even sure how to dress or what to do. You know, so, it, you know, they, this is almost an afterthought of the founders, you know, the whole judicial branch. So the Marshall Court, of course, um, John Marshall being the most consequential, really, I would say, um, Chief Justice uh, in our Supreme Court history thus far, right? It can change. But nonetheless, the point of the matter is, is that it was John Marshall's decision, really, um, or at least where he was at the helm of the court in Marbury versus Madison, that, of course, gave the court its most important power, and that is the power of judicial review. And it was, You're supposed to go. oh, darn it, sorry. <laughs> that power is <laughs> judicial review. Yes, it was supposed to be a surprise. <laughs> my big graphic here. Okay. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> but the point of the matter is, is that this single decision made the, the uh, judiciary a co-equal branch with the other two branches. And... It was hugely consequential. I don't want to get bogged down in the details because we've already covered it. But you know, suffice it to say that, again, Marshall reasoned, reasoned logically that it is, of course, the court's purview to decide disputes between the executive and legislative branch and ultimately to decide whether or not laws or actions either by the legislature or the executive are, in fact, constitutional. That in and it of itself gave the court so much power, or rather at least gave it a substantial amount of power such that it could be considered a co-equal branch. And remember, judicial review is not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. It was almost, it's considered, you could argue, sort of what we call an inherent power of the court. Inherent, meaning that this just is simply what judges do. And that was... It flows logically. Yeah. So, I mean, what else would a judge do but judge the law? So, ultimately, if a law goes against the Constitution, the Constitution is the highest law it's like the, the, the ultimate trump card in the deck of cards. And so it has to be, it has to be superior to everything else. Remember the supremacy clause. And also we've talked about this case, which was McCullough versus Maryland. Uh, and there's other really important landmark cases of the Marshall Court, like Gibbons versus Ogden. But we did talk about McCullough versus Maryland. Again, remember that is where the Marshall Court upheld the power of the supremacy of the federal government and the U.S. U.S. law and U.S. Constitution over the state governments, and also a very broad reading of congressional power, you know, with the implied powers such as creating a national bank, and decisively placing the power of interstate regulating interstate commerce um, under federal sort of um, supervision. Sorry, under the federal purview. 
All right, so <clears throat> in the modern era, uh, the court has been, you know, sort of jumped more into the political fray, um, deciding, th you know, major decisions about our, our rights and liberties under the Constitution, uh, especially, especially civil liberties, you know, redefining or often, you know, clarifying what's what exactly is meant by freedom of speech and freedom of religion and, you know, of course, getting into issues like abortion and gay rights. And so the court has really, you know, jumped into these areas more so than they did typically in the past. And also looking at, you know, national versus state power, you know, the whole conflict over federalism, as well as, you know, what's the proper role for the government in the economy, economic regulation, which at one point was generally rejected by the court, but then, you know, after FDR and during the New Deal, the court eventually started upholding more government regulations over the economy. So, so really big issues. So we're looking here at the three um, sort of, well, indeed, three chief justices. Um, I, you know, Mr. Phillips mentioned that Marshall, of course, we mentioned this already, that it was most consequential. I also think it's worth noting that if you look at the Marshall Court followed by the Warren Court, then the Rehnquist Court, they sort of track with the eras of federalism too, right? I mean, certainly you'll notice that with the um, Marshall Court, while they did indeed establish the supremacy of the federal um, you know, government and federal law, they also didn't go so far as to blend the powers or rather um, allow for the federal government to reach too far into what was the state domain or areas where the state exercised power. So we would definitely associate that a little bit more with um, dual federalism, but essentially remember the, the entity or the government that really needed to establish itself during that time was the federal government. The state governments had already been established, and remember the federal government was much more weak um, or weaker, if you will, than the state governments from the get-go, um, given the fact that they were coming out of a confederacy. So what the Marshall Court essentially does is it clear, more clearly defines the domain of the federal court and the federal government. Um, then we fast forward to the Warren Court. The Warren Court's going to be marked by an expansion of civil rights and civil liberties. And we're going to see a lot more leniency given to the federal government to do what it needs to do. And so we're going to see... Um, expansions of um, the federal government being able to enforce certain civil rights and civil liberties um, as it pertains to citizens within the states and also declaring certain state laws and provisions unconstitutional because of their inconsistency with um, rights and freedoms that are um, more broadly interpreted by this court in the Constitution. So the Warren Court is going to see a much broader interpretation of the various components of the Constitution. The Rehnquist Court is going to mark a shift back um, to a more conservative uh, position, a rollback of some civil liberties, a push towards more states' rights. We're going to see that while the Warren Court, you know, actually wasn't the Warren Court, but a, a, you know, the Burger Court, we get the Roe v. Wade decision. The Rehnquist Court, while it is going to uphold Roe v. Wade, it's going to definitely, and Roe v. Wade was the court case dealing with abortion rights, um, or if you will, uh, you know, right to choose to take, you know, have abortion. The, the idea here being is that um, they allowed for states to put further and more limitations on that particular, um, you know, that particular right. And so in addition, the Rehnquist court we're going to see is going to map on or track very, um, you know, conveniently with New federalism, the idea that we're going to see more power um, devolved, pushed back towards the states. So um, we see the decision, for example, U.S. v. Lopez is going to be decided by this court and others that are going to sort of um, give states some of the powers that perhaps they had lost um, or just sort of they, they are now reclaiming once again uh, here in the Rehnquist court era. The Roberts Court is essentially a continuation of the Rehnquist Court, um, but I would add that they have rolled back civil rights here too, but they have expansion, expanded corporate power more, um, and it seems that it's tacking a little even more conservative than the Rehnquist Court. So we'll see how things proceed, but these are the current 
prevailing trends. All right. Well, let's. I don't. I can't remember how much more we have left here. Hopefully, get in under two hours. Anyway, so yes, FDR when he was in power, the court was when he was president. The court was striking down a lot of his New Deal proposals, finding them unconstitutional, and he was getting frustrated. So he he uh, re suggested that we should increase the size of the court. Now he he framed it as, hey, a lot of these guys are old, so a lot of the justices were over seventy. You know, these guys are old. They need some help, you know, getting things done in there. You know, we want to help them out and get some younger members on the court. And so let's let we should appoint a new justice for every justice that's currently over the age of 70. And so this could have led to uh, six new judges being appointed all at once. Of course, FDR would be able to handpick these justices and they would then hopefully he thought over or sorry, uphold his New Deal legislation and hold it as constitutional. So. Now, when he made this proposal, it was very controversial, and people saw it, you know, basically for what it was, not something he did out of the kindness of his heart, but an attempt to grab power to, you know, just sort of overturn the court's rulings. Now, um, when you study U.S. history, you'll see that suddenly the court starts to change direction, and they start upholding some of his key New Deal legislation, and people would argue they call it the switch in time that saved nine but they're also, you know, that's kind of uh, disputed because apparently the, one of the key rulings they made was before he made this suggestion. They just hadn't announced it publicly yet. So anyway, it, but nevertheless, it never, it never, it did never, it did not ever pass. But it, it is, it is something he tried to do. Um, and so anyway, so you can see the, it was rejected by the Senate. You know, it's worth noting very quickly that this was an institutional decision. Why do I say that? Because in 1937, um, you know, Congress was overwhelmingly Democratic. Um, so this was a Democratic president as well. And indeed, what was happening here is that you saw Congress uncomfortable with the idea that the executive would be able to sort of also wrest control of the judiciary. And so this was in some ways sort of a tug of war of the check and balance here that was going on more than, uh, if you will, an ideological one. So it's worth noting. However, it would, you know, it's worth noting too that in the Democratic Party, there was also a lot of uh, conservative Democrats um, in the party too. So uh, I guess what I want to suggest here is that while this may have occurred here in the 1930s, it's unclear that something like this wouldn't be able to happen here in the future considering how partisan things have become. Um, you're going to see a lot less defection, if you will, and a lot more partisanship and party loyalty when it comes to these efforts, as we've seen, if, if, if you will, if history is prologue, then we're, we're definitely in store for something like that. Um, but, you know, it, it is an interesting footnote, nonetheless. So can you finish this up? Yeah, yeah, I will. So here we have some important uh, here we have some important court terms to know. The writ of certiorari I already talked to you about was the decision to hear an appeal from a lower court uh, when you're trying to have your uh, decision um, heard by the Supreme Court. There's, again, very few cases that are heard every year. And uh, don't forget the rule of four, right? You have to have at least four justices um, agree to hear your case in order for that case to be ultimately um, heard by the Supreme Court. Uh, stare decisis, we already mentioned, again, this is the idea that the judges are going to be deferential. Notice that the courts, the judges are going to not just be deferential, won't just be deferential, rather, when it comes to legislation passed by the government and, uh, for that matter, the legislative and executive branches. Remember, we talked about the reason why there were so few laws or acts being overturned, but they're also deferential to each other, especially their lower court brethren. In other words, the higher court judges are going to be reticent, reluctant, you know, um, they're not going to be very inclined, rather, to overturn the decisions of their lower court brethren for a couple reasons, right? One, the assumption here is that their lower court brethren were are competent, that they are, you know, smart, intelligent, uh, capable individuals who can properly apply and follow the law. 
Um, and the other being is that they can sympathize, right? I mean, a lot of the higher court judges are were former, um, if you will, lower court judges. Um, but nonetheless, they also want to make sure that there isn't too much volatility in the court process. If, in other words, the lower court judges are always being overturned, then the reliability of any judgment by a lower court judge is going to be put into question, and that will undermine the legal system altogether. So the disposition of the courts is oftentimes deferential. They're, in other words, reluctant, not very willing to overturn and change things very quickly um, or in a uh, rash way. So stare decisis. Informa pauperis is the idea here that the costs of a court case would be paid by the government in the event that you are what's considered an indigent defendant. Indigent is just another way of saying poor. So if you're too poor to cover the costs of paying for your own lawyer, the court will, or the state will, the government will, pay for one for you. Um, the idea being is that in order to be able to have a fair trial, you absolutely need to have a a, a lawyer, and in that this was an obvious thing, or that's an obvious thing to us today, but that was actually not an obvious thing early on, and it wasn't until the court case of Gideon v. Wainwright that this um, particular uh, right was also guaranteed to all defendants uh, across states as well, um, criminal defendants. So nonetheless, you should be familiar with informa pauperis. And one way to remember this is, of course, the word pauperis, the root word is pauper. And a pauper, P-A-U-P-E-R, is a poor person. So it's another way of referring to that. So you can uh, look at that mnemonic device to help you recall that information. I already talked to you about standing. In other words, how important it is to prove that you have some stake in the matter. In other words, you can't just say, well, I hypothetically won't like this law in the future, or I would like the court to determine the viability or the legality of a law, you know, before it's even um, been enacted or implemented. The court won't do that. So you have to prove that, you know, one, that, you know, you've been harmed, uh, that you suffered some tangible harm, and two, that there's some remedy that the court can give you in light of that harm. Um, and so the, you, you have to be able to prove those things in order to have what is called standing um, and uh, be able to move forward with your case. Um, now, class action cases, uh, these are cases where a lawsuit is brought on behalf of all similarly situated persons. What does that mean? It means that there are instances when um, there are individuals in society that have all suffered a similar harm. So, for example, you've all heard a lot of these com commercials, right? If you or a loved one have suffered from mesothelioma, please call the law offices of blah, 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 right? And, you know, I, it, I can almost guarantee you, you or your parents um, have been uh, asked to join a class action lawsuit because a lot of them have to do with um, malfunctions or problems with car parts or um, car issues or maybe some drug that they were taking or medicine they were taking. So invariably, almost everyone has been either involved or has been asked to be involved or could have been involved in a class action lawsuit. Not everyone. I'm, I'm being exagger I'm exaggerating here a bit, but not by too much here. And now, there are pros and cons to class action cases. So why do they happen? Well, one, it is a convenient way to get everybody who's been affected by a similar situation in one case, right? Instead of having like 500,000 different cases about people who've been exposed to meso, or rather have mesothelioma, you know, they're going to have like one big one or a few big ones. Um, so it's, it's going to help make things efficient. It will prevent clogging up the courts, because the courts have a lot of cases to decide on their docket. I hope you don't already know this, but if you do, then um, you'll know that when you file a court case, it can take years sometimes for it to be decided or to move forward with things. And so um, it, this is a very long, drawn-out process. So anyway, the class action cases help sort of to make things more efficient, 
and help to expedite matters. You know, um, another you know benefit is, of course, that um, if you're a, a single person trying to go up against, say, a corporation, the corporations have enough money to pretty much wait you out, or um, if you will, they can outspend you, outweight you, and they may even outweight you until you die or pass or whatnot. But the point of the matter is, is that they can delay, 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 because they have very deep pockets. They have a lot of money they can spend, whereas you don't. And so they bank on the fact that if they delay long enough, you'll either drop it or they can give you a, a very minor settlement, something that's not even really worth what you've suffered. Um, or you just be so frustrated, right, that you, you just don't want to deal with it anymore. Um, so here then, the, the little guy, so to speak, can uh, stand up to, if you will, the big corporations. Um, but as a group, right, there's power in numbers, right? And so that's the idea and the principle behind the class action cases. So it's to allow people to have a fighting chance, if you will, to right a wrong. And while, you know, a particular case on a singular or individual level may seem small, when you multiply that by thousands, it has huge ramifications. Um, and so you want to make sure that, you know, these lawsuits sometimes are brought in order to also change corporate practices. What we see is that sometimes corporations won't change their practice unless they suffer a substantial financial harm. Um, and, you know, we've seen instances of this, for example, the Ford Motor Company, um, there is a famous law suit there where they knew, um, there was a memo where they circulated, they knew that there was a fault in, or there was a flaw in the design of one of their cars, and if you hit their cars near this gas tank, it would be likely to explode. And instead of fixing or recalling the cars and fixing it, they decided that it was more cost benefit, or rather it was um, more cost effective to just sort of, you know, pay out certain amounts of money uh, to the people who will die in these situations if they die or, you know, and wait them out or something to that effect. So um, this kind of really um, cold calculus, if you will, um, really sort of spurred on, you know, these class action cases. Now, of course, the uh, arguments against class action cases are that they are, uh, they can be abusive and that, they are trying to exact a lot of money from the corporations for the sake of just exacting a lot of money, um, that the lawyers who agree to take these class action cases are more interested in the money than they are in the issue. Um, so that brings me to another point. Um, usually class action cases are um, going to be started by lawyers and who have agreed to take the case now, again, they, of course, I'm not going to say they all are just in it for the money. They're not. I mean, they believe in making sure that they are righting certain wrongs. Others of them may be in it only for the money. But nonetheless, the point of the matter is, is that um, the criticism is that these are ways in which lawyers are just trying to get more money and, and line their pockets. Um, the reality is very mixed in that, yes, while that's true, the lawyers typically, they are going to get paid first, and then what is ever left over is then distributed among the plaintiff, the people who uh, are part of the class action. But imagine the fact that a lot of these people would have seen nothing, right? Now, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't get more, and you can make that argument, but the fact that, you know, between nothing and something, um, that's good. And the more, more important case here is that when and or if you win your class action case, whether or not you get a large sum of money, because there are people you, you can see interviewed, they're like, well, I don't care how much I got. I'm just, I want to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else, right? So that, in other words, that this corporation stop doing the thing that they're doing that harms other people, um, that sometimes is indeed the bigger and larger victory. So class action cases are interesting, but nonetheless, uh, you should know what they are. Amicus curiae are legal briefs that are typically written by supporters of a particular, um, you know, position on a court or on a case before, uh, usually uh, the Supreme Court, but it can be other courts. But nonetheless, the idea here is that it's often interest groups that want a decision in their favor. And so they'll have um, some lawyer that works for them or set of lawyers that work for them draft a, a, a letter to the court. Um, arguing why one side should win over the other or prevail over the other. 
and indeed because they recognize that any Supreme Court decision is going to have national implications. So indeed, the decision may not be originally about that interest group at all, but the decision will have implications for them. So you could imagine, you know, maybe an individual person is suing a state because they want, um, you know, uh, less gun control, for example. Um, while the NRA may not be named in that suit, they would most likely file an amicus curiae in favor of that person because, generally speaking, they'd be in favor of less gun regulation. So these tactics are used by interest groups to try to get favorable um, decisions from the court on a particular issue they deem important. Now, finally, senatorial courtesy here is the traditional practice that presidents will consult with the senators from the state where a judicial vacancy exists. In other words, if a senator is from, say, um, Minnesota, and all of a sudden, or rather I should say, if there's a vacancy uh, in Minnesota, one of their federal judges decides to retire or has died, then they'll need to be replaced. And presidents will typically because, again, judicial nominees have to be approved, right, by the Senate, the practice has been, right, as a nicety, they would typically ask the senior senator from that state, or senators, rather, if they're okay with the person there, or, or rather ask them, I should say, um, who they would like to see on that court. Um, so uh, they'll consult with these senators, either asking them for a list or um, asking them if they're okay with the person they are about to nominate. Um, it applies mainly to district court judges. It should be noted that presidents are going to be particularly uh, keen on hearing from the senator that is from their own party in that state, if that is even the case. Um, so this is, again, a practice you should be familiar with when it comes to the appointment of judges. And that, I believe, that, I believe, concludes our PowerPoint presentation. Thank you for listening.